Good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to our lunch and uh, to the meeting again. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Warner. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, another thank you to our sponsors, uh, particularly uh, Piper, Jaffrey, uh, who's here. Uh, I'm going to introduce Jim in a, in a second. Um, one thing I did want to mention, you heard uh, this morning from Maury about all of the uh, information that we provide for the industry and the work that we do. And of course, you're here because a big part of what ARM does is uh, bring the investor community and the uh, uh, companies together to talk about uh, the promise of the industry and the clinical data that drives the industry. But I do want to mention also that another big role for ARM is advocacy for the sector. Um, we've got a lot of challenges that will provide challenges and opportunities for us in terms of whether this sector is really going to meet the potential that I think we all believe in, whether they be with Congress, whether they be on the regulatory side at FDA, or with uh, CMS and private insurers on the reimbursement side. And so a big part of ARM's mission is to bring the community together, bring the companies together to work on these common challenges, work on these common opportunities for the benefit of the industry in a way that individual companies might not be able to do it successfully. So I encourage you all to participate in those activities. If you have any questions, you can certainly come up to me or Maury or Bethany or anyone on the ARM staff uh, for more information about that. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, Jim Douglas, who uh, is a managing director at Piper Jaffrey. In his uh, previous life, he was with Abbott Labs. So in addition to the work he does now um, with Piper, he has experience in the pharma industry. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jim now to moderate our lunchtime discussion. Jim? Great. Thank you, Michael. And thanks to Maury, as well as all the colleagues at ARM that have helped put this together for the fourth year in a row. And we were talking leading into this that every year, I think it builds upon itself. And ARM has really turned into I think what it envisioned itself to be is a very important industry advocacy group. So congratulations to all the firms that have committed to help build that, and I think you're realizing the benefits of what you set out to do. So as each year improves, I think this is the most excited I've been to be up on the stage with uh, panelists who their names and their firms, I think, um, are known to everybody in the, in the room here today. So I won't belabor the introductions um, in too much depth, but importantly, Tom Voivod, who is a partner at Versen Ventures, and Ben Ospitz, who is a um, partner at F Prime, previously referred to as Fidelity Biosciences, two of the most well-known blue-chip uh, biotech specialist investor groups on Wall Street. And if you have one of them in your companies, you are probably going to have a successful exit. So I think there's nobody better to talk to than the two of these gentlemen about what it takes to have a successful financing generally and then in the environment that we're currently in today. So. You know, a few notable investments that they have in the gene editing, gene therapy, and broader regenerative medicine spaces, they'll um, refer to um, as they introduce themselves a little bit further. So what I'll do is just turn it over quickly to Tom and Ben, both of who are PhDs, Ivy League educated, and have all the pedigrees that you'd hope to have here on the stage with me. So um, with that, Tom, why don't you t take it from here? Okay. Th uh, thank you very much, Jim. And Thanks to Piper and Arm for putting together a great conference, and mostly to all the entrepreneurs out there, all the companies that are working and making great progress. It's great to be here and see all the, the progress that, that everybody's making in this field. So I'll just give a quick overview of Versant, uh, keep it short. We are an early stage venture capital firm. Uh, there's really two uh, distinguishing characteristics I think about Versant. One is our geographic reach. So we have offices on the West Coast in San Francisco, here in New York, also in Canada, and also in Basel, Switzerland, where I live. And the reason why that's important is really giving us access to companies that are developing great technologies. I'll quickly mention three of them. Uh, out of Europe, one company is a company called Annapurna, a gene therapy company. Started focused on a Friedrich's ataxia gene therapy program out of Inserm in France. We uh, then teamed up with Ron Crystal here in New York at Cornell. He had a, has a lab full of really exciting gene therapy programs. We brought three into the company. The lead one is for alpha one atrypsin deficiency. Uh, Ron managed to get IND and approved IND for that program, and now we are looking to merge Annapurna with Avalanche out on the West Coast, uh, which just recently filed a proxy statement for that, and uh, looking to build a, a really substantial gene therapy company uh, in, in the field here. 
The second company that came out of Europe for us is a company called CRISPR Therapeutics. I'm sure everybody knows, of course, about the, all the excitement around uh, genome editing. I think what a lot of people maybe don't recognize is that this field really started in Europe. Uh, the woman who is often overlooked for the contribution she made to open up this field is a woman named Emmanuelle Charpentier. She's the one who discovered tracer RNA, how the whole thing comes together and how that complex works. So she is a founder of CRISPR Therapeutics. We've accessed our intellectual property rights through Emmanuel. We were the first investors in uh, before everybody thought this was such a great field to be in. We put the first 10 million into CRISPR and then recruited a really good uh, syndicate to join us. It's been amazing to watch the growth of that company. We've now raised over 100 million in equity capital and uh, did two major deals. The first one with Vertex, brought in another 100 million in capital, and then the second with Bayer has 300 million in committed capital. So a sleepy little company two years ago, 10 million, now has about 500 million in operating capital and is, and is uh, gearing up, uh, trying to bring programs into the clinic uh, next year. Uh, the last company I'll mention again in Europe is a company called Gensite. Bernard Jolie was here today, this morning, presenting. It's a company in uh, gene therapy in the optic space, uh, entering phase three. So those are, uh, I think, a few of the companies in this space. And again, for us, having feet on the ground in Europe, uh, in addition to all, all the uh, things we're doing here in the U.S., we are investors in Audentes on the West Coast, a company that recently filed an S1, so I can't talk too much about that company. But we're, we're bullish on this space and recognize that innovation happens all over the place in North America and in Europe, and we're trying to take advantage of that. Fantastic. Ben, maybe say a few words. Sure. So, <clears throat> so F Prime is the venture capital arm of Fidelity Investments, which probably most of you know is a very large asset manager. So we're managing the house money and venture capital. Like Versant, we're global. Uh, we have offices not just in the U.S. and Europe, but also in China and India, and do a lot of work in healthcare and life sciences in, the, in those geographies. Um, Within therapeutics, we invest at all stages and in all therapeutic areas. Uh, most of what I do is early stage, and we've had a real focus uh, actually in cell and gene therapy. I'll just quickly mention a couple of those companies. So uh, Regenex, uh, which I believe is here today, uh, Dimension Therapeutics with AAV companies, uh, Unum and Adapt Immune in adoptive cell therapy, and in gene editing, uh, Precision Biosciences and Caribou, which is another holder of the foundational Cas9 IP. Uh, and then a company called SEMA uh, in, in cell therapy. So it's an area uh, of great interest for us, and it's you know, driven by a fundamental belief that you should go where you have medicines which have a really big effect size. And uh, one of the things that's very interesting about cell and gene therapy, and which I think has driven the field, is you've had some initial clinical results and a lot of animal data that suggest really transformative benefit. And that's what I think is fundamentally the driver, and it's what's changed, I think, for all of us in the past, you know, five to seven years in, in the space. Fantastic. So why don't I set up the discussion here a little bit as just to remind everyone the topic of our conversation is capital markets and, and, and attracting institutional investors. So that's where this conversation will ultimately go, and specifically to the ARM uh, subcategories of gene editing, gene therapy, and the like. So. My day-to-day -day job on the investment banking front is, you know, it's easy to get focused on the here and now, and, you know, people are a, a little bit of an anxious mode as to what's next. And it's easy to focus in on where we sit here today without taking a th moment to appreciate where we came from and, you know, what got us to where we sit today. And, you know, we talk all the time with Wall Street and New Yorkers of tale of two tapes here in the biotech cycle that we're living in, and I think more appropriately for the San Francisco guests and companies, it's really what a long, strange trip it's been, is how <laughs> I would better describe it. And you boil it down, and my job, I think, is to oversimplify anything for investors and companies, and you boil it down to kind of a few key factors as to what got us here. And you look back and forget that, you know, not too long ago, the financial crisis created this massive pool of easy capital in a low interest rate environment where central banks are trying to promote investing, not saving, investing. But the byproduct of the uh, financial crisis is there wasn't a lot of growth opportunities to invest in. Housing was gone, consumer products were gone, not to mention the oil, energy, and gas um, environment as well that's continually been part of the global slowdown. So. Investor psychology is the second part of that. We had the financial crisis. Investor psychology needed to change to find growth opportunities. And I think quickly, smart people found growth opportunities, which 
specialist investors like Ben and Tom had known and been around for many years, and they've been building companies like yours to ultimately access the capital markets or be acquired by large pharma who had um, IP issues, pipeline issues, et cetera. So the third factor I look to is the dynamics of large pharma. And that was a little bit of luck, perhaps, sequenced in after the financial crisis, is that the large pharma dynamics were um, exacerbating what Tom and Ben had been building. So people all of a sudden, in their conversations at Fidelity and elsewhere, said, where do we put all this money we have? And lo and behold, generalist investors started coming into a sector that long had been only reserved for specialist investors. And as we all know, crossover investors came out of that as well, which are very, very instrumental to IPOs as we live today with insider participation, et cetera. So I think the investor psychology changed so much that even though investors were burned maybe a decade earlier with the um, Human Genome Project, they started to think, you know what, many of these therapies are just 10 years behind the promise they showed 10 years earlier. A lot of clinical data has been achieved. Maybe we were just too early to the game in the early 2000s and 1990s. And I think that proved to be largely true, that a large, lot of good clinical data did evolve. And 2012 hit, and we were off to the races. The FDA did the most approvals in 20. 12, 2014, 2015, all were record approvals. So the FDA and the regulatory environment was very uh, set up very well for this investment um, world that we were in. And up until the second half of 2015, we were averaging around 90 IPOs a year. And since the second half, when the window shut a little bit, you know, we have had 60 IPOs. And since 2016, we had six IPOs. So this year's only been six IPOs, and we think the sky is falling. Well, six IPOs is the total amount of IPOs in all sectors. So biotech is still the source of IPOs, and of those six, two, which I will call the highest quality of the six, were in gene editing and gene therapy with the Vexus um, and the Editas. So very, very positive dynamics are still occurring within gene therapy, or within biotech. And so I think you look at the returns of recent and the IPO environment of recent dates and, you know, focus on where we were. Your, your money has quadrupled over the last four and a half years if you were an investor, and we've pulled back about a third. So life is still pretty darn good in the biotech sector. And I think we'll transition here into um, conversations with what Tom and Ben see, um, but I think that their, their view is shared that we're in a prolonged super cycle of the um, biotech world. And, so with that, I will turn it over just to get a few macro views from Tom and Ben. And they're always trying to, you know, evaluate risk and invest at an early stage in therapies that are look promising and in industries that look promising over a long horizon. So keep that in mind when we're talking about Series A or early stage investing. That's where these guys are experts in. And I'd like to get their views on, you know, how has your psyche changed maybe in the recent environment and how does it look going forward? So Tom, if you wanted to kick off again, we can go with you and then go to Ben as well. Sure, yeah, so I think you know, today it feels a little bit tough, right? I mean, the biotech markets have come down a lot. There's been a lot of focus and attention on that. Our view, honestly, as early stage investors, we know that IPO markets come and go. We, you know, we lived through 2000 when that IPO, the biotech uh, market was going through the roof and then it cratered and you know, that's just, that happens time and time again. In fact, we did analysis, we looked back to 2010 and there were about 12 periods between now, sorry, I look back to early 2000, between now and 2000, there were 10, actually I think over about 12 periods where the, the biotech index, in the index dropped over 20% over a six month period. So, you know, the, this, just, this is part of the business of being a public uh, biotech company. The, the financial biotech markets come and go. What is a very steady trend is pharma acquisition of biotechs. And so we as early stage investors are encouraged and we think that that's a trend that is gonna just, that is gonna continue. You look over the last 10 years, while you have this cyclicality in biotech IPO markets, you see this steady, steady trend of pharma acquisitions of private biotech companies. It's, if you look over the last, back to 2000, it's 10 billion a year or more on private stage biotech companies acquired by pharma. And over the last five years, it's been 20 billion a year or more. And that trend is just continuing to go up. Our best exits have come in years when there have been no or very few IPOs because you have multiple pharma companies acquire, uh, bidding to acquire those companies. So, uh, you know, I think this is a little bit uh, status quo. It's, it feels a little bit tougher right now because it's been such uh, a decrease. Um, but I think you make a really good point. Again, if you look back to 2010, 
and you plot the increase in S&P 500 versus the increase in the, the uh, NASDAQ Biotech Index, the NASDAQ Biotech Index at its peak was up around 350 percent from 2010. The, the um, S&P 500 was up about 50 percent at its peak. So we've come down from there, but we're still way above where the S&P 500 was if you look back five years ago. So I think overall the industry is very healthy, the dynamics are very good. Pharma is going to continue, I think, to be really hungry for those innovative products that biotech is developing. And so as a whole, I think this trend of value, uh, value creation within the biotech industry is going to continue. Yeah, so I, you know, I agree, obviously, and I think when you're investing in an early stage, it's very hard to time the market five to seven years from your investment when you're actually uh, uh, prepared to tap that. I, I do think that one change that I, I'm seeing is uh, the, av the availability of what I'll call mezzanine capital. You know, so um, in 2013, 2014, 2015, it was actually very easy to rapidly add to capital, low cost of capital for a company because people were expecting an IPO where they thought they'd get liquid and they'd get, they'd get some quick up uptick on their mezzanine investment. And that enabled different strategies of how you build a company. It enabled you to do more because you could access more capital cheaply. Uh, I think that's still available for a number of companies, and you know, we are seeing uh, sort of a, a little bit of a, of a bimodal distribution in, in, the mezzanine, uh, in the mezzanine market. So I think it is still possible, but I think as a, as a kind of core strategy, uh, it's being de-emphasized now in most of the companies that, that we're seeing. How do you, you and other board members on companies that you're sitting on, as you look at various exits, M&A being one, and long-term liquidity through an IPO, potentially. Has your cash management st strategy changed within companies? If you've recently gone public, do you say, you know what, we need to focus in on our top one or two key programs to preserve cash for an unforeseeable horizon? And if you were evaluating 10 companies before at an early stage level, has that net um, refined a bit so that now instead of deploying capital into 10 new companies, you're expecting a longer need for your cash and maybe only putting into the top two or three um, preferred private investments? So, so I, I think it certainly has made everyone a little bit more thoughtful about the long-term financing strategy of anything that you start at a given moment in time. So uh, I think it was much easier when you had a high probability of being able to raise a mezzanine or a Series B round easily um, to do things alone as opposed to syndicate them and to think we can start small and even if we know we're going to need 70, 80 million dollars to really bring this to a proof of principle that's going to be meaningful, we don't have to solve that problem today. We can put in the first 15, the first 20 and, and figure it out. I think now what I'm seeing, you know, not just at F Prime but across our peers, is, is a little bit more um, interest in solving the financing problem at the outset. So if we really think it's going to take $100 million, we're really going to take $60 million, maybe let's solve that now as opposed to, you know, get started and expect to, you know, do a round and get an uptick later. It's better to have the certainty for the program than it is to uh, get the lower cost of capital overall. And that's probably a balance that's shifting. Yeah, so I, I would agree with that. I think uh, today companies, of course, are more conscious of their financial strategy. Capital is not as available today as it was you know, 12, 24 months ago. That being said, uh, from our perspective, we really haven't seen a change, a shift in early stage investing. It's very interesting. If you look back over the last 10 years, the rate of new biotech company formation is relatively steady over the last 10 years, even over the last three years when capital was readily available. And the reason for that, and that's, that's a huge difference, by the way, from the IT world. When the, the last three years, you've seen a massive increase in the number of IT companies that have been started. And, and who knows why that might be. I think one of the reasons is <coughs> it's a lot harder to be a biotech entrepreneur than it is to be an IT entrepreneur. You know, the people who are heads of biotech companies are really experienced people who have been in the industry for a long time. And that rate of, you know, available talent does, hasn't really accelerated the way, you know, if you're a really smart 20-something girl and you've got a great idea, you can probably start an IT, an IT company. So, so from our perspective, um, the rate of company formation hasn't really changed. Uh, these, again, it's, you know, uh, these cycles in the public market are, are kind of status quo for us. Our rate of new uh, deals that we've invested in early stage deals has been the same so far this year as it was last year. So we haven't seen a dramatic uh, shift in that. 
and, and just to add on that, and I think I think there's some data on this, but I can't remember exactly the uh, the figures. But the, uh, the the w even when we were getting a little bit more money into early stage, the number of companies was not increasing as much as the money behind the yeah, companies. That's right. And, and it does, I think, likely speak to the fact that you mentioned, Tom, the rate limiting factor is not simply capital. It's the people who can actually do this. Yep. Yep. That's, that's actually a very interesting point. And I think from the underwriter's perspective and talking about accessing capital as we are today, you know, there's been 200 plus IPOs in this current cycle that we we're talking about. So just the magnitude of companies that have gone public is you know, unfathomable at some level. And so the differentiation of technologies within sectors is hard to discern between. And we talked a little bit about the crossover investors, generalist investors, joining specialist investors like yourselves into pre-IPO rounds. And as an underwriter, it's sometimes hard to talk to companies who have a fantastic technology but don't necessarily appreciate there's two other legs to the stool of investors and management. And many times, the other two pieces are more important of getting public. So as you sit here today, manage, key management, to your point, is maybe the bigger constraint than capital many times. And as crossovers and generalist investors might not be at the doorstep for crossover rounds, which were so necessary in this IPO environment, you know, insider rounds used to be a sign of weakness to an IPO. 10% 10, 10 of IPOs had an insider participation. Now it's north of 40%. It's an expectation. And the percentage of the deal is close to 40% of the deal. So that capital is a constraint. And now as a public company investor, you have this pool of 200 companies that have just gone public. Only the companies that have the most differentiated of technologies, you know, we talked about Avexis, we talked about Editas, Adentes, you mentioned it's an S1 filing. So companies that have significantly differentiated technology, I think will and we believe will always get public. But now you have this pool of 200 companies that you can invest in at below IPO valuations. How does that change, maybe not in your business models, because I don't know if it's in your charter necessarily to be able to invest in these opportunities opportunistically, but how do you see that affecting the broader capital pool that why would I take a IPO risk as an investor at valuations that are debatable where I can get into this follow-on marketplace or just buying stock on the open exchange um, at much depressed valuations or lower valuations? Do you think that's changed the psyche of investors generally and potentially affecting the IPO market for undifferentiated technologies? Yes. I mean, I, I, I think those are just direct. When someone looks at a follow-on and looks at an IPO, for many, those are directly substitutable goods, right? And so uh, I think it absolutely, as, as supply goes up, it has a predictable effect. So. I do think in this environment, as um, IPOs are, are harder to do, as you point out, Jim, there is a lot of capital out there. There are a number of companies, public companies, who have a fair amount of capital. So I think that's going to open up some alternative routes of financing for private companies. I mentioned Annapurna that's undergoing a merger with Avalanche, uh, accessing that capital to take forward those programs. So those kinds of financings, I think, you know, the, the good news is the biotech industry did a great job of raising a lot of capital over the three year, the last three years. Now what we need to do is make sure we use that capital very wisely to advance meaningful programs in the clinic and generate, you know, true value. So, you know, we, our, our, our tanks are still full, even though the, the market is a little bit depressed right now. You know, looking at the last three years, we have raised a lot of capital. Most companies are well financed. We're not worried about going over the, off the cliff in the next 12 months. What we need to do is use that capital really wisely to continue to drive you know, these programs forward and show people that the biotech industry can generate products with real value. And, and I'll maybe draw an analogy between right after 2008 when sort of you know, it was a very bad situation for everyone in biotech, for sure. And uh, you know, of course, you're worried about your companies, but then you, you sort of have this predatory thought, which is, well, maybe there'll be some really great opportunities to buy things low, given the terrible state of the market. Uh, and what we found, and I'd be interested if this is your experience too, is the, the companies that we thought were really high quality, that price turned out to be very sticky. Because you know, when, when, when it was a good technology, it was a good team, they knew, their investors knew, everyone knew. And there weren't a lot of great deals on great technology. I'm sure there were some, but it was not the rule. You know, in general, the A assets you know, were, had, a, had an A or an A minus price. It wasn't like the bottom fell out. And I suspect the exact same thing is gonna happen with publics who are fairly well financed and in a good situation, is that they will not, 
there won't be real bargain hunting for great technology or great products. No, yeah, I agree with that. Fully agree. And I think that's a good segue here into gene therapy and gene editing into the forward-looking um, cycle here. And we've got about five minutes, so I'll move quick, maybe um, talk a little bit about what happens to happen next. I think the promise of gene editing and gene therapy has been unprecedented. People can visualize the importance of the cure and from rare disease to things like Parkinson's uh, with Voyager and others that are treating um, larger indications. So what has to happen next to get past this proof of concept stage into approvals and a commercial engine behind gene therapy, gene editing, and just regenerative medicine? Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll just quickly talk about gene editing. I think you know, part of the reason why it's really captured the imagination the way it has, first, I think a lot of people don't remember, gene editing has been around for a long time. You know, I sat next to Ed Lefier last night of Sangamo, and so gene editing has been here for the past 20 years. CRISPR has really caught the public's attention because it's so easy to use. Every academic lab out there is using the CRISPR technology, and it's really exploded the accessibility of this technology to go after all kinds of different diseases. But I think it's, it's not so difficult to put together the pieces to recognize that uh, engineered cells work. We've seen lots of examples of that. We've seen CAR-Ts. We've seen the work with Blue, uh, Bluebird with their Lenny virus engineer cell. They work. You take these cells out of patient, you engineer them in ways that today are a little bit cruder, but, but the ways that we'll continue to improve on. You put them back inside patients and they can have some pretty profound effects. So it's not such a stretch to say, well, then now we're going to use a precise genome editing approach to engineer those cells and get even better effects when we put those cells back into patients. So to me, that explains a little bit by why we've seen such uh, enthusiasm uh, around the gene editing space. It needs to continue to prove it out. We need to see these programs move into the clinic to generate cl clinical proof of concept. But I don't think that's so far around the corner for the gene editing field. In the gene therapy field, it's, you know, again, it's another field that's been around for a long, long time. Um, We've seen you know, real momentum coming. We've seen the first product on the market. You know, the ADA skid is coming. Probably have the next uh, product on the market here in the near term. We've seen an explosion of programs moving to the clinic, generating positive clinical data. Um, I, you know, that, I think that wave is going to continue. I think the, the smart uh, pro, uh, diseases that people are going after is where the biology is really well understood. These are monogenetic diseases. We know exactly what we have to do to, to, to have an impact on that disease. We're going after local administration, uh, you know, CNS, heart, lung, things like that, where it's, it's a much more manageable problem. I think over time, the gene therapy field will build on that to go after, you know, broader diseases, systemic diseases. But I think we'll just continue to see a progression of positive clinical data as more and more of these programs move into and through clinical development. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be built on, on clinical data. And it's just remarkable. I mean, if you look at the CAR-T field, how many people had tried some form of CAR-T and basically it was uniformly ineffective uh, until they fixed, you know, co-stimulatory problems, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you saw just a dramatic difference from that one engineering change. Uh, I think that the driver is always clinical data. And if you think now, there are really only, outside of CAR T, there are only really a handful of real clinical proof of principles we have in gene therapy. I mean, it's you know, four or five different applications, and some of them are generalizable, right? I mean, if you can transduce a CD34 positive cell, there are a lot of things that that plausibly can fix. If you can transduce five to ten percent of the liver, there are a lot of things that can plausibly fix. I think there are a lot of sort of, even at, at the crude level of an organ type, the jury is still really out what we can do in certain areas. And as we start knocking those over one by one, I think it sort of opens that horizon for each of those areas. One of the topics we talked about a little bit leading into this was just drug pricing generally. And I said I didn't want to get this conversation mired down into drug pricing. I think in any election year, it's political rhetoric, and it's easy to just talk about that. And Ben and Tom both had me pause. I said, you know, we feel that is actually a very relevant and important topic. And it does come into our psyche as investors, because as we started out the conversation, they take technology risk. They're coming in at Series A or earlier and betting on technologies that'll work. And in the context of gene editing and gene therapy, their comments were some, something, and I'm paraphrasing, I'll let you finish the sentence, but you know, pay for performance and different types of reimbursement strategies do need to be addressed because it is, as the clinical data does prove out, commercial strategies are gonna be very important. And if we're kicking a can of reimbursement down the road, it's not the drug pricing issues that we're hearing about in the press today with all the names that we're sick of hearing about, but it's drug pricing in a different 
theme that I think was more prevalent a year, a year and a half ago when I was talking with gene editing companies, this pay for performance concept and how is this gonna be re reimbursed? I know Josh Schimmer and Charles Duncan have been talking about this two years out, but that's quieted down a little bit. And I was surprised to hear the two of you say, no, 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 drug pricing is a very big issue to us. Yeah. So maybe elaborate on that. Yeah, I, I, so uh, I do think it's critical, obviously, for the industry. Um, what I'm really pleased to see is I think the, the, at least within early stage venture, the focus of investing has really shifted. 10 years ago, you may remember, there was kind of this real focus on what we call fast follower. You know, we wanted to reduce risk. So the industry was investing in second, third generation, uh, small molecule inhibitors that, you know, they, we thought, oh, for the third to market, that's okay, because some big farm's gonna want that product and come along and buy us. That, has, that, that is over, so that, that model is dead. That doesn't work. Uh, you know, we as really stage investors, we have to, as you say, we have to accept technology risk. We know that, you know, we, not everything is gonna work, but for us, to invest in something where you accept technology risk and you get over that technology risk and you bring it to the market and nobody cares about it, that, that is an absolute failure. We cannot do that. We have to invest in things where we know there's technical risk, but the potential of that product when it gets in the market to completely transform, we've heard that word a couple times today, transformative. This is what we need to be investing in. You know, gene therapy indications where there is no, no therapy on the market today for these kids and, and adults who suffer from these diseases. That's what we need to be focusing on as an industry. And the focusing on the value versus yep. getting caught up in the pricing in and of itself. Yep. I think that Ben had some good comments yeah, on no, that. Yeah, no, and I think there's kind of the, the positive side of the, value, of the value model, and then I'll, I'll give the brief sort of negative or depressing side. I mean, the positive <laughs> side is that there really is a very strong case for some of these medicines to charge you know, prices that are actually unheard of in our industry. So if you think of, there's a program um, out, of, uh, out of Italy for metachromatic leukodystrophy, which is a horrible neurodegenerative condition, invariably fatal. It appears they have a permanent cure with integrating virus CD34-directed therapy. You know, it appears to be highly persistent. Um, so if you think that a human life is worth $100,000 a year, and you have, in fact, saved 70 productive years of someone's life, that is a really big number. And that would be a really big number that you could support, and you could stand there and say, that's why I'm charging it. And you know, that would be an argument that logically you should win. I, I would say that the, the depressing part is that logic doesn't always triumph in these types of conversations. And the sheer sticker price is something that I don't think people are psychologically prepared really to accept. I mean, we saw this with Savaldi, which is a one-time curative therapy, obviously small molecule. But what we hope to do with gene therapy, one-time curative therapy, it's a remarkably cost-effective, but it had a big sticker shock. And so that's one thing I think we're going to have to deal with. I think another is that there are going to be drugs that have charge a high price now that in the future we're not going to be able to charge that price. And that's just the reality. Yep. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you think of these things, that's coming. Yep. Great. Well, I think that wraps up our conversation here. Um, I was asked to tell everybody that the sessions are starting downstairs um, right when we wrap this up. So if everyone wanted to finish up their lunches and go downstairs. We do appreciate you sitting in with us.